Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear. And this is my oscilloscope. This is the most used piece of kit in my studio, and it doesn't even make noise. <laughs> I am feeling burnt out lately, but I still want to put a video out. And so I sat down and I said, what can I record in one take without planning ahead that I know people are interested in? And I get questions about this all the time, probably because I use it in essentially every video, uh, and it looks cool. <laughs> but I figured instead of just twice a day saying, this is my BNK Precision 1530, uh, and then moving on, I can point people to a video that explains what it is, what I'm doing with it, how to set it up, how to set up an oscilloscope, you know, somewhat similarly, and having that sort of base of that's what a square wave looks like, that's what a sine wave looks like, that's what resonance looks like, can help us better understand other controls and other synthesizers, even if they aren't analog and even if we haven't seen them visually. To me, exploring sound with a visual component is really, really useful. That is why, in many ways, I think... The Mini Log is uh, one of the greatest first synthesizers because it has a built-in oscilloscope, and you can see and understand the changes you're making when you move controls. Anyway, that's it. This is all going to be about uh, using a hardware oscilloscope for simple audio visualizations. Of course, a lot of the things I'm going to explain will apply to software as well, but I'm not going to show you how to work any particular piece of software. Uh, I think the only hope for this video doing well is some compelling title and thumbnail, so I still got to think of that, <laughs> but otherwise but otherwise, I expect this to do pretty low numbers, which is okay, because I know the people who really want to see it are the only ones who are going to see it, so if you're subscribed or support me on Patreon, I really appreciate that. It, it means so much to me that people are willing to do that, uh, but if you aren't either, thanks for watching. I encourage you to consider supporting me however works for you, if that's a comment or subscribing uh, or eventually Patreon to get some... Um, you can download some patch packs or some NPC expansions or whatever else, or you can just buy merch. And I think there's a piece of merch that has this oscilloscope on it. Uh, I'll put a picture up of it now, and the merch is on drawblovesgear.com. There you go. Okay, no more shilling <laughs> onto my specific scope. This is a BNK Precision um, 1530. It is an old analog oscilloscope, and I didn't buy it for any particular reason. It was what was cheapest on eBay at the time that I was looking that was described as working, and I think it looks cool. And knowing what I know now, uh, the only guidelines I would give you, if you want two channels, make sure you can have two channels. If you want to show things in stereo or show two things at a time, uh, there are digital oscilloscopes that would be just as effective. They're a little less quote-unquote vibey, <laughs> but they would be able to show you waves better than this and with more precision in controlling things and triggering, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. I don't use it for anything that requires serious accuracy. Occasionally, I'll probe for audio when I'm fixing stuff, uh, but just to see if it's there. You know what I mean? Okay, if I change the pitch on this, do I see a response here? I'm not doing any precision work with this, and if you are doing precision work that requires an oscilloscope, I would not recommend something old, probably in disrepair, or any more analog. But if you're just trying to visualize synth waves, hardware scopes are fine and have the right vibe, you know, for demonstrating these things and showing these things off. It fits with analog synthesizers. So to summarize all that, uh, buy a listing that has been tested, if possible, or is being sold by somebody who can answer questions about it. What it had done before, how recently it had been on and used, things like that. And if it's described as working and it shows up to you and it isn't, you have some chance of being able to get your money back. But if somebody says as is and you buy it and then it shows up broken, you're stuck with uh, sci-fi set dressing. <laughs> okay, so let's assume you get one or you got one or you're curious about how they work. First, how do I even get signals into it? Mine has on the front BNC jacks. That's going to be pretty common. They are like a twist locking connector. You're going to see a lot of that. But I use an adapter that brings it out just to a quarter inch. And I plug the under other end of that quarter inch into my auxiliary sends from my mixer. I do that so I don't have to change what's plugged into this. I just need to, on the mixer, turn up the aux sends for aux 1 or aux 2, which send to the left and right channels of my oscilloscope. Uh, you can get those little adapters cheap, or if you need one that goes from RCA to BNC, I'm sure that exists as well. I believe they're just a mono connector. Certainly what they display is a monophonic signal, or a monaural, excuse me, signal. Chances are, whenever you walk up to any oscilloscope, or you know, you turn it on for the first time, the settings are gonna be in some insane place. So I'm just going to randomly turn a bunch of these things. <laughs> I'm gonna act like I just turned this out of a box from a Goodwill or something. So for me, my power switch is the intensity of the trace, is the intensity of the light. So it flicks on like that. Yours might be separate controls. I would turn your intensity all the way up to start with, and if you have a separate power switch, turn that on. And the first thing I check is which channel am I on. I've got A and B channels down here, and the mode, the overall display mode of the oscilloscope has a few options, but if we're just going to do one channel, I'm going to pick the one we're using, which right now is B, 
An audio signal is an AC signal, certainly in regards to what we're talking about now. So I'm going to flick it to AC. And yes, what I'm showing you is specific to the B&K Precision 1530. I said it again. I said I wouldn't. <laughs> but this is common terminology for other B&K oscilloscopes. And if it's not the exact terminology, we'll certainly transfer to other oscilloscopes. All I've done intentionally so far is set the mode to A or B, whichever we're plugged into. I'm going to use B, and you'll find out why. And because we're showing audio, I've turned it to AC. I'm using my MS-10, so the whole control panel is visible to you, and I can still be lazy and use a single frame <laughs> and a single camera. But we don't see anything yet. So the first two things you got to do, and this should be on any oscilloscope, there will be triggering modes, and triggering decides when the trace shows up. So I need to flick this into normal and not single. Normal might be called continuous, but I want to be in normal mode. And then your triggering source... I have line, which we see something that's good, and one or both of the channels. You can see if I'm triggering off the same channel I'm sending audio into, I see something. I'm sending audio into A as well. Alt for me works on both. That might not be true for you. There's also external. I'm not going to mention that now. But I'm going to leave it on line because line shows us something all the time. Okay, And that's where I want to start. There should be a mode on your oscilloscope that's continuous or normal triggering. Okay. That's triggering source from line or on or constant or fixed, something like that. And then from here, even when I'm not playing any audio into it, we can get some things set up a little better. Okay, first and foremost, our position. So I can change horizontally on our field here where that line is. And our focus, I can change how precise that line is. And I'm actually going to turn down the intensity a little bit so it isn't so different for the camera. And we're getting a little closer. I've got one more position to determine. I want this line to be right in the center. Now, immediately, the way the display works becomes really, really important to understand. So what are each of our axes? On one axis, we have our voltage, or how high or how hot our signal is coming in. And on the other axis, we have time scale. And so here, I have time division, it's called. Variable sweep slash time division. If I turn it down, that line moves left to right slower. If I turn it up. Eventually, it's a continuous line. Cool? So our time scale is our horizontal component here, our x-axis. And our other, our y scale, or volts per division, is right here. And so now if I play audio in, we can see something changing. But I want more of my screen to be taken up for a given button press. That is where this volts per division. So we're turning up our Y scale. And so you can see now, there's certain notes that I play that stay pretty evenly on screen, right? That's because it's close enough in time to our time division knob that it's resetting at an even interval. But instead of trying to like, ah, I need to change this, or I need to change my pitch to get it to stay continuously on frame, we're going to go back to our triggering mode and trigger off of the same channel we're sending audio into. And that works well for synthesizers because they're even cyclical waves, especially if you aren't running it through delay or reverb or anything. And then if I play a note, it will stay on frame. It will stay locked to where we're at, which is awesome. That's exactly what we need. Now, I'm lucky in some ways to know what I'm doing, so I could just kind of, like, you know, get my way there. And I know which of these controls aren't and are... I know which of these controls are and aren't important. So I'll talk a little bit more about stuff that might cause you to have nothing on screen. On this delayed sweep oscilloscope, if you have delay for either channel on, you'll get that. So I turn it off. You'll have coupling, AC and DC... For me, that doesn't change much, but I leave it on AC because I know it's correct. For a lot of the controls, this is true. Hold a note, and then click something in and out and in and out and see if it stays stable. Awesome. So to recap, you want to make sure your triggering mode is either constant or off of the channel that you're sending a synthesizer sound into. You want to make sure you aren't using a delay on your trigger or on your display if that's a feature of your oscilloscope. There's something called hold off, and you can think of that as like a hold time or a decay. I turn mine to maximum. This is it at low, and then at maximum it's continuous. Also, I should mention, there is going to be a lot of interaction between 
the rate of things displaying on here and the shutter speed of your camera. I'm not going to talk about videography, but just know that right now my shutter speed is twice my frames per second and they're in even division on purpose. So I don't get weird stuttering or anything. But in real life, just like video footage of a cathode ray TV, uh, you might see flickering or lines that are not represented in real life. Anyway, that was a tangent. <laughs> so to sort of summarize, okay, the things you should try and sit down and figure out. Figure out which two controls are your volts per division and your time per division. Figure out which controls modify your X and your Y axes, okay? And know and remember that and remember your full signal path. Since I'm sending it from an aux send, the level from my mixer also has an effect, and the level of the synthesizer will, of course, also have an effect. All those things, and then augmented here with our y-axis. So a louder sound is taller, or I can multiply that here. All of that will affect how clear it is, how clean it is, things like that. But just, it's this big, it's really this big balance. <laughs> you want to make sure that your position is about where you want it, and you can set that. I like to set that when I'm just on line triggering mode, everything in the center. You want to make sure your triggering mode is something you understand, and for displaying synthesizers, channel triggering is the most useful and where I'm at 90% of the time. And then focus and intensity and holdover all make things stay on screen a little clearer a little nicer. That's pretty much it as far as like how to set up any hardware oscilloscope. Find your X and Y, get your triggering figured out. Everything else, see what makes it brighter or stay on screen a little longer. Uh, read the user manual if you have to. I'm not above that and neither should you be. <laughs> okay. There are other ways to use this oscilloscope right now. I'm just showing one channel. But there's a dual channel mode. And for me, that makes things a lot more stuttery. So normally I'll use dual channel if I'm just trying to visualize something or I'm trying to, or if I expect to show anything where understanding serial behavior is important. And then I have separate controls for my A and B. But we can still only trigger off of one channel. Since it's the same thing, it doesn't make a big difference. I'll show you an example here when I'm doing something different on the, actually, you know what I can do? I can send my voice into one channel and the synthesizer into the other but I want to trigger off with the synthesizer. So right now you can see I've got a separate signal. This is my voice. This is my voice <laughs> coming in on the bottom channel and the top channel is just uh, the synthesizer. That could be a synthesizer and a drum machine. That could be two separate synthesizers. That could be left and right of the same synthesizer. There is, so again, the modes, we have just one channel just another channel, <laughs> which is my voice. We have both of them separately, and we have add. And add, you guessed it, I'm adding the two channels together. In this case, a synthesizer and my voice. But there's another final way to incorporate these two. On the very top of my scope here, you can see it changes everything when I get there. But this makes the time division, or the X scale, that makes it whatever's coming to channel B. So right now it's my voice, and channel A is a synth. And you can get some really sort of fascinating interactions. I need to change their position relative. But you know those videos of like people showing off, oh, I'm drawing a mushroom, oh, I'm just drawing insane stuff on an oscilloscope? This is how they do it. They use modes like this, where they have sort of plotting control of the X and Y through whatever two inputs that it is. And they set it up to make whatever pictures. Really, really cool. And there's advanced software to do that, or they could plot it, you know, really meticulously. I don't do any of that, but just so you know, that's how those are working. They are using uh, the left and right channels to control the X and Y axes. <laughs> For me, it's just a different, uh, sometimes more interesting, sometimes less clear way to uh, have a visualization. And if I made this really big, it would cover up the whole screen, and maybe that's a good visualization for whatever I'm working with. Um, generally, no. <laughs> Generally, for me, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be displaying on, at most, I'll be displaying on dual channel like this. And most of the time, I'm only using a single channel. Okay, that's it. That's about all I can think of just off the top of the dome. This is my solution to uh, having time to film, but not time to plan, <laughs> and not really much time to edit. Uh, I hope it was useful to somebody. I'm going to link it whenever somebody asks about the oscilloscope. 
I appreciate you watching. Hope it was useful. Uh, look at your noises. It'll help you understand what you're working with. Okay, cool. My name is Jorb. I love gear. That does certainly include the B&K Precision Delayed Sweep Oscilloscope 1530. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. Cheers and so long. That's all you're going to get out of me right now. <laughs> see ya.